All right, hey guys, um, going to run through the A&P, Anatomy and Physiology PowerPoint. Um, hope everyone is doing well. I have uh, been on the boat this weekend, so um, kind of apparent by the red face. So um, anyway, I'm gonna get through the sunburn and we're gonna talk this over. So let me go ahead and go to share my screen and we'll run through that PowerPoint for you guys, okay? All right, let's talk about chapter two. Um, it's gonna run through a lot of different things. Um, there won't be a ton of straight questions from this chapter, there will, will be some. Um, what what's it super important? I'll try to make clear to you guys as we're going through these slides. So <clears throat> anyway, we go through all the different systems here. I'm going to run through them as quick as I can and just kind of talk about the main ideas. The reason that I really think this chapter is important is that it lays the framework for a lot of the things we'll be talking about in each chapter. You know, when we talk about uh, down the road, if we talk about the dermis or the epidermis, you know, we won't have to go back through this integumentary system that's on this, this particular slide. You'll already have that early in the semester and something that you'll recognize. So the integumentary system, that's basically your skin. You've got three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. Um, Hypodermis being the deepest layer, dermis, middle, and epidermis is your outer layer of skin. So that's, you know, you, you see that come into effect, like say during a burn. The uh, severity of a burn is, uh, comes down to which layer the burn goes into, basically. So that's, that's where your layers come in. Um, accessory organs that are in the integumentary system are the ha hair and nail and the hair follicles, nail and the nail beds, glands and nerves are also found in the skin. Okay, what are the functions of the integumentary system? Um, it acts as a nearly impenetrable impenetrable protective barrier and that being said you know um if you have a cut an open wound things like that that makes it much more penetrable so you know say you were going uh, somewhere that was going to have a lot of germs involved or something you may want to cover cuts and things with band-aids that's that's the point of keeping your your barrier intact um, there's multiple layers. It's full of keratin, uh, contains dendritic cells. It produces melanin, which you know selects the color of our skin, is, is related to the amount of melanin that's present. Um, and we have cells that are surrounded by glycolipids. Something else that's very important is the skin helps to regulate body temperature. Um, Dilated blood vessels in the dermis release heat to the environment. That's how we cool off. Um, activated sweat glands release water-based sweat, which carries a lot of heat. So we've got radiative cooling shown up top. Evaporative cooling is when we actually sweat. That's to cool the body. Metabolizes vitamin D. That's um, a lot of times we've got vitamin D inactive in our blood vessels that are found in the dermis. Um, it helps to metabolize these. Exposure to UV radiation starts the process of activating this precursor. Uh, pro provides cutaneous sensation. So we've got sens sensory receptors that respond to different stimuli. You know, they detect pain, pressure, heat, and cold. These are, you know, it tells you, oh, my hand is on a hot stove. Let me move that. It's that simple. Skeletal system. Need to know what this consists of. Bone, cartilage, and ligaments. That is the skeletal system. Tendons are not included 
in this skeletal system. So remember that particular information. Um, it, it includes compact and spongy bone. Compact is the outer layer of all bones. It's really hard, dense. Spongy bone is just like it sounds. It fills the center of many bones and the end of long bones. Spongy bone is not as strong as compact bone, but there's different. It's made the way it is for a reason. So the functions of the skeletal system. It gives a structural framework of the body. You know, that's it's our skeleton. You take that away and we're just a blob of muscle and uh, skin and organs and with no framework. So we got to have that. Um, it supports the skin and muscle. It also supplies attachment points for muscles and tendons, which allow for movement. Another thing that it does is it, it, it uh, protects our internal organs and the soft tissues. Uh, cranial bones obviously protect the brain, vertebrae protect the spinal cord, and the rib cage protects your organs, the heart, lung, liver. Uh, it serves as a lever system to permit movement. Uh, as I said on a, two slides ago, I think skeletal muscles attached to bones. Uh, you have them on each side of joints, the attachments, so you can move accordingly. Muscle contraction moves the bones at the joints. Um, the skeletal system also stores and releases minerals. It has a lot of calcium. You think of strong bones, you think calcium, you think drink milk. You know, you've seen the commercials and heard people say that, and, it, and it's true to a large degree. Um, the amount of calcium, if you're low in calcium, then obviously your bones are going to be affected as well. Um, the skeletal system releases calcium when blood levels drop to ensure muscle contraction and your nerve impulses are working properly. Also red bone marrow is in the skeletal system as well. That's the site of hemopoiesis, which is just the process that produces blood cells. Um, Different blood cells include red blood cells, white blood cells, and the cells that eventually fragment into plate, platelets, which deal with clotting. Bone undergoes continual remodeling. So there's a certain degree of breakdown and rebuilding going on all the time. There's two different things, and you need to know these two, these two words here. Um, it requires osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts build bone tissue, and the way that I always tried to remember that was, was to say blast, B, build, blasts, build. Um, osteoclasts break down the bone tissue. When osteoblast activity exceeds the osteoclast activity, then you're going to have bone growth. When it's growing, more than it is breaking down, you're gonna have growth. This remodeling is affected by hormones in the body. Some factors that affect your bone health, um, hormones, dietary intake, exercise, also to a certain degree, sex, age, obviously are gonna play into that as well. Um, the most the, the people that are the most vulnerable to osteoporosis, which is, you know, weakening of the bones, seems to be older women for the most part, just by rule. So those that does affect age and sex, has some effect on that as well. Some hormones that affect bone health. Cal calcitonin, um, that's released when blood calcium levels increase. Um, they don't really even know for sure what the role of calcitonin is, but it possibly stimulates osteoblast and inhibits, inhibits osteoclasts. Parathi parathyroid hormone also, excuse me guys, I've got the tongue tie going on today. Um, it's released when blood calcium levels drop. It stimulates osteoclasts and inhibits osteoblasts. 
um, it's a big major regulator of your blood calcium levels. So we're talking here, um, you're going to break down and release calcium because of this stimulating of the osteoclasts and it inhibits osteoblasts. So really uh, it, it keeps your levels in your blood proper, but if this happens too much, you're gonna see too much breakdown in the bones. Estrogen and testosterone, they stimulate osteoblast activity and calcium deposition. So you're, that's where that helps to build your bones. Human growth hormone stimulates the growth of the epiphyseal plate. We'll talk more about that. Thyroxine stimulates production and release of additional human growth hormone, which indirectly affects bone growth as well. <clears throat> so which which nutrients affect bone health calcium obviously is essential for the bone matrix vitamin d is needed to be able to absorb calcium and protein is necessary to form collagen so as far as exercise and bone health weight bearing exercise stimulates remodeling so weight bearing exercise um, kind of brings the osteoblasts into play where you can build that bone. That's remodeling. That's the full function though, where uh, you're causing a little bit of breakdown um, and repairing it with new bone, which makes the bone stronger overall. Osteoblasts deposit bone along the lines of mechanical stress. That's where you, when you're working, doing weight bearing exercise, there's gonna be some lines of mechanical stress. So you're gonna have new bone deposited there. Osteoclasts are gonna break down old bone to create new, the space for this new bone that's coming in. Your joints, they are all surrounded by a double layer joint capsule. Um, the outer fibrous la layer is strong and flexible. There's a synovial membrane that produces synovial fluid in your joints. That's very important because it's kind of like uh, the oil in your car. It's going to lubricate those joints and help things to move smoother than if it is not working properly. The joint cavity contains this synovial fluid, which reduces friction between the bone ends. It supplies nutrients to nearby cartilage and contains cells to eliminate debris and microbes. So there's a lot of things there that, that are very important you know when you don't when you have more friction between your bone ends and your cartilage is not healthy you're going to start running into breakdown you're going to start running into arthritis and we'll talk a good bit about arthritis later also and this is just a picture of a general synovial joint such as the knee shows where the um, synovial cavity is where the fluid is contained and then you could see there how it could help to lubricate and promote easy movement with that fluid that's, that's there. It's the main thing that I pick up on, on this picture. You can also see it's got a good picture. It's not really meant to be uh, the large part of this, this drawing here, but you can see the spongy bone as are all the little holes, you know, looking, the spongy looking holes in the bone and the outer edges are all solid. That's your compact bone that we talked about. Uh, some other things that stabilize our joints, tendons, they connect muscle to bone. You need to know that. Ligaments connect bone to bone. You need to know that. Your menisci, that's, that's your cartilage. That improves the fit between the end of your bones where they meet at a joint. Bursa, they are they they reduce friction. They're common in shoulder and knees. Um, when you hear bursitis, that's when these sacs become inflamed, um, irritated, maybe infection. Um, you've all probably heard of someone with bursitis. Tendon sheaths, they reduce friction. Those are common in your wrists and your ankles. 
So what affects joint flexibility? The structure of the articulating surfaces, how, how well they meet, how well they work together, the tension of the ligaments on each side of the joint, the arrangement of the muscles that are acting on the joints and what the joint is used, is used for and how often it is used um, if a joint is being stretched regularly, you know, a proper stretch, you're going to have more flexibility there than you would otherwise. Your muscular system, it consists of skeletal muscle. It helps us to maintain our posture, provides stability across joints like we just talked about, provides the force for locomotion or walking, moving, running, produces heat to maintain body temperature. We talked about cooling of the body. Now that talks about how our muscular system actually helps to maintain our body temperature as far as helping us stay warm. Um, muscle tissue has a property called excitability, and that's the muscle fiber's ability to receive and to respond to stimuli, um, which can either be chemical or mechanical. The more excitable, the muscles fibers are the faster the more effective that muscle movement will will be in turn extensibility is another property that's the muscle fibers ability to stretch up to three times its length without breaking that's pretty amazing actually um, an extended muscle fiber can still generate force the amount of extension affects the amount of force generated um, the farther it's stretched out, you're not gonna have as much force there, or you would be more prone to tears, injuries, and things like that. But overall, you can still promote, generate force, just probably not as much once the muscle fibers are extended and stretched. <clears throat> Elasticity, that just comes back to it's another word for like recoil. If you stretch a bungee cord, a rubber bungee cord, and you let it go, it snaps back. That's what this is talking about. The muscle fibers, they have ability to return to their original shape and length after contracting or stretching. You know, also, if you took a bungee cord and you smush it together, it's going to fling back out normal. So it just it wants to re regain original shape regardless. Contractility, that's the muscle fiber's ability to contract, which generates force. It can be isometric or isotonic in nature of contraction. We will get deeper into that as we go through the semester. And we'll get deeper into isometric right here. And then the next one should be the other. Um, isometric contractions, they generate force without shortening. The muscle does not overcome the resistance. That would be such as you pushing against an immovable wall, me putting my hands together and pressing together and not letting either side win. That is an isometric contraction. I am still contracting, just not, there's no movement involved because there's no lengthening or shortening of the muscles that, that happens there. Isotonic contractions, the muscle shortens while generating force. So that's where, you know, like when you flex your muscles, you know, the gun show, you um, are going to, or, or, or think of doing curls, you know, bicep curls. When you bring that weight upward, your muscle's going to shorten and get bigger. Um, that's what you're seeing there is an isotonic contraction. Force is generating to overcome the resistance, like curling a dumbbell. Um, <clears throat> it occurs in two phases, concentric and eccentric. The concentric phase is during the exertion phase of an exercise as the muscle is shortening while overcoming the resistance. Um, pushing the barbell up during a bench press is an example eccentric phase of a contraction occurs during the return phase of an exercise. The muscle still generating force, but the force is insufficient to overcome the resistance. So think about bench press. Um, 
if you didn't have this eccentric phase, it would just slam onto your chest. You're lowering the barbell during a bench press. You're going to generate enough force to keep it from slamming down, but you're still not overcoming the resistance. Um, you'll, your muscle's going to be lengthening while still contracting in this stage. Here is a uh, diagram basically of the components of skeletal muscle, muscle fascicles, muscle fibers, myofibrils, actin and myosin. Those are myofilaments that goes from largest to smallest as you can imagine. Here's just a picture of um, muscle as we're talking about here. You should, you're seeing it, um, how it attaches via tendon to the bone and it goes all the way down to myofibril um, inside of each muscle fiber, which the muscle fibers are broken down into fascicles and those come together into skeletal muscle. Um, the components of a skeletal muscle fiber, sarcolemma, sarcoplasm. Your sarcoplasm is where the nuclei, mitochondria, glycosomes, myoglobin, are found. You also have sarcoplasmic reticulum. A lot of big fancy words on here. We are not going to test on that. We just need to know kind of what's going on. So we're going to cover it. So here is a close picture of a skeletal muscle fiber. Again, you will not be asked to draw this diagram to um, label the diagram or anything like that, but it is a good way to see how complex and diverse the body is and how it's put together. It's really pretty amazing when it's broken down into pictures like this where you can really see how the everything works together. Muscle growth. There's, there's growth and then there's deterioration. The growth is hypertrophy, which is an increase in this cross-sectional area it means growth in muscle fibers. Um, atrophy is the opposite. That's a decrease in the cross-sectional area of fibers and it results from disuse. If anyone has ever had a cast on or a um, splint or anything that kept you from, move, from using a particular leg or arm or something, when you got that taken off, you definitely saw some atrophy from disuse and it does not take long for that to happen. It's a lot easier to lose it than it is to gain it. Your nervous system, you've got components that are the brain, the spinal cord, your cranial nerves, and your spinal nerves. Those are the components of the nervous system and you need to know those. Um, the function of your nervous system, it regulates homeostasis in the body, which is kind of like equilibrium. Everything's working as it should. Um, by sending the proper impulses where they need to go, once they're received, different things happen in the body. Um, different types of cells in the nervous system, neuroglial cells, they supply nutrients to the neurons. Um, they help to maintain an appropriate environment for impulse propagation, which is saying, here's an impulse, this is what we need to do, it's sent out, and that's, things work better when the neuroglial cells are doing their job. Neurons, these are impulse propagating cells. They respond to stimuli. That's what moves when you put your hand on the hot stove or you cut your hand with a knife. <coughs> they convert stimuli into impulses. They control effectors, which are things that make things happen, either glands or muscles. Uh, they enable thought, feelings, and sensations. So neurons are obviously key to our nervous system working properly and efficiently. Uh, there's three parts of a neuron. You've got the dendrites, the cell body, and the axon. The dendrites, that's the receiving portion of the neuron. They're catching it and saying, okay, what do we need to do? They open it up and look, oh, this is what it is. So then it goes to the cell body, which takes that code and says, okay, this is what we need to do. Here you go, axon, hands it off to the axon, which carries the impulse out, reaches a synapse, 
with an effector, which we just spoke of what the effectors are, um, and it branches into axon terminals, terminates in synaptic end bulbs. That's how, that's kind of how the transfer of information is sent in the nervous system. Here's just a picture of what we were talking about. Um, the dendrites here, this is catching the signal of what we need to do, comes down the axon, goes out to the axon terminals, uh, the neurotransmitter there, it's sent, and it sends the um, information out of what needs to happen next in the body. <clears throat> There's two major divisions of the nervous system. CNS, which is the central nervous system, it, that consists of the brain and the spinal cord. There's also a peripheral nervous system, which consists of cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and specialized sense organs. Okay, how is our nervous tissue protected? Um, number one, it's basically by bone. Your cranial bones, as we said, they surround and protect the brain. Imagine walking around how easy it would be to have a brain injury without those cranial bones. Same thing with your vertebrae, they, they surround and protect the spinal cord from injury. If it was just there exposed without the vertebrae around it, it would be very easy to damage our spinal cord. Um, some other protection of the nervous system, you've got meninges, they're connective tissue layers, they surround and protect the brain and the spinal cord. When you hear meningitis, that's um, infection, inflammation of your, of this layer here, a connective layer around the brain or spinal cord. Your cerebrospinal fluid, that's what fills the spaces between the meninges. It's found in the brain ventricles, also in the central canal of the spinal cord. Sometimes they pull cerebrospinal fluid for testing for different things. Um, also, when you have a, you know, a neck injury, uh, a lot of times you will see that there will be um, cerebrospinal fluid what can actually leak out of the ears. That's just a note of this. So obviously there's been damage if that begun if, if that starts to occur. Um, the next system is your endocrine system. It works with the nervous system. It helps to maintain this homeostasis, which is the body working as it should, um, staying where it should be, you know, blood, blood pressure, blood sugar, all of these things like this. It releases your hormones to control body activities. That's what the endocrine system does. And it has a lot of influence on many of your body functions. Yeah. The hormones in your body, they travel through your blood vessels and they have effects that are exerted on different target cells. Um, they have receptors for each of these given hormones. They target cells directly or indirectly uh, return conditions to normal. They either, so they're either making a, affecting a change that needs to happen or they're kind of stopping something that's going on that they want to cut that off. Hormones can do either one of those. Um, the hormones will continue to function until they're broken down by enzymes. Okay, your cardiovascular system is next. You've got the heart, blood vessels, and blood. That is what composes your cardiovascular system. The function of this system is to deliver oxygen and nutrients to cells and also transport waste products from your cells. Okay, the heart, we all know that's the pump. It drives the blood through our blood vessels. Your cardiac output is the amount of blood that is pumped per minute. Your heart rate, number of times the beat, the heart beats per minute. Your stroke volume, is the amount of blood that is pumped from the left ventricle per heartbeat. So just, this is a pretty good slide as far as if you don't already know these things, you probably did. If you did not, you just need to know cardiac output, stroke volume, what those mean, because we will refer to those as we're going through the semester. Blood vessels, they're just conduits for blood, um, pipes, hoses, whatever you wanna picture them as that our blood runs through. Um, they are arteries, capillaries, and veins. 
your blood is composed of plasma, which is the fluid portion of your blood. It has dissolved substances and water in it, and our body is made up of about 60% water, so that's partly where it is. Um, there's also formed elements in your blood, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Let's go back for just a second. Your red blood cells, they help to get oxygen where it needs to get in the body. <coughs> Excuse me. Your white blood cells, they deal a great bit with um, fending off illness. And your plate, platelets are what, to, what helps the blood clot. And that's where we'll stop for here, but that's the general idea of what the main function of those formed elements in the blood do. <clears throat> your respir respiratory system is composed of your nasal cavity, pharynx, trachea, the bronchi and their branches, and the lungs. And what it does, it replenishes the blood in your veins with oxygen while removing carbon dioxide from the body. Respiration, we've got different levels of respiration. We have ventilation, which is just thinking of regular, just breathing, external respiration, internal respiration. You know, what happens inside of the body when that's going on. And then there's respiration at a cellular level also where that's where the transfer comes in, um, bringing, handing off oxygen that you need, getting rid of the carbon dioxide that you do not need. The mechanics of breathing, we have a pleural membrane. You got to think about the uh, diaphragm and the external inter intercostals, they help with breathing. Um, the diaphragm, when you are um, inhaling, your diaphragm actually pulls down you know, towards your belly button, which lengthens your lungs. That, when it pulls down like that, it basically sucks air in through your mouth, nose, that way by making more space for air to come in. Um, your intercostals, which are basically muscles along the rib cage area, also help to help with inhalation and exhalation. <clears throat> your lymphatic system, it's composed of lymphatic vessels, lymph, lymph nodes, your spleen, red bone marrow, and your thymus. Uh, what your lymphatic system does, it returns interstitial fluid to blood vessels, which we have fluid in our body that is taken to the blood vessels, sent out through waste as it needs to be. When you have lymphedema, you've probably heard or seen someone who has that. You have uh, very swollen areas. Um, that's when your lymphatic system isn't working properly. There may be a blockage or something. So you're not, this interstitial fluid is not being uh, taken away and it's building up in certain areas. Uh, it transports fat soluble substances from the digestive tract as well. And it provides immune surveillance. So it's watching for things, sickness, watching for germs, watching for bad guys in your body to try to take care of those. Um, so how does uh, interstitial fluid happen? What's going on with that? Hydrostatic pressure from the heart forces substances into interstitial space, which is just some kind of free space. There are openings between things in your body. Um, osmotic pressure from proteins in the blood pulls some of the substances back into the blood vessels. Your lymphatic vessels take the remaining fluid to prevent swelling or edema from happening. Here is a flow chart of the overall flow of fluid. Again, you won't have to list this out or anything. It's just a good way to follow and see how it happens. Um, as far as transporting fat soluble substances, um, 
fat soluble substances they enter lacteals after absorption no big deal on that don't worry a lot about what are lacteals what are what are we lacteals merge they form larger lymph vessels is what what happens there and that's where lymph is filtered through your lymph nodes um, so your fat soluble substances and other lymph components are delivered to blood vessels that are near the clavicles right up here close to your shoulders and neck area. As far as immune surveillance, your red bone marrow, it produces white blood cells. Your lymph nodes, they filter lymph looking for pathogens. That's the site where most encounters happen between pathogens and white blood cells. You know, that's the battle for getting back well when you have strep throat or something like that. And that's when you, when you feel your glands swell when you go to the doctor and they're they're feeling around on your neck and all they're looking to see if you have swollen lymph nodes <clears throat> your spleen also works to filter your blood for pathogens as well there's the non-specific resistance in the body it just provides immediate and general protection from pathogens and things such as that the components you've got mechanical barriers, chemical barriers, and just reflexes that are innate to the body that are going to happen to help protect ourselves. Um, some additional components, phagocytes, inflammation, you know, swelling is something that uh, tells you something's wrong. It also is, is part of the process of healing. Uh, fever, you know, a lot of times when you have fever, first thing we want to do is get it down. But a lot of times I think, you know, and I, I'm the first one to pop a Tylenol or something if I'm running fever. But if we would let fever run its course, that's the body's way of naturally fighting off things that need to be fought. Um, there's also natural killer cells, which are out there roaming, looking to get you know, to take care of things that are harmful to the body. And we also have protective proteins in the body. Um, phagocytes, they are white blood cells that engulf pathogens. They include neutrophils and macrophages. So you see that that's very important to have in your body. They see something wrong, they attack it, engulf it. Inflammation. It's triggered by infections or physical trauma. You're gonna see redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Um, the benefits of this inflammation is it walls off that infected area, it keeps it from spreading. It disposes of cellular debris and it sets the stage for repair. So as, as irritating and bothersome as inflammation and swelling may be, it is actually serving a very important purpose. Fever happens when pathogens invade certain white blood cells. Um, it's stimulated by release of pyrogens, is what it's called, from white blood cells that increase the body's set point for temperature. So there are benefits. It stimulates the intensity of phagocytosis, which you, we just talked about how they attack pathogens speed up metabolic processes in the body and it causes liver to sequester or hold iron. Natural killer cells in the body, they release perforins, uh, enhance inflammation, and they, these are just involved with the nonspecific defense that we talked about. There's protective proteins in the body as well, called one is, um, interferons they interfere with viral rep replication so when you have a virus these keep it from keep it in check to a degree as much as possible keep it from growing um, there's complement proteins also they initiate a cascade of events that help protect the body from pathogens as well they work together um specific resistance, it's slower to respond to an initial encounter, it's triggered by antigens, and it requires recognition of a particular antigen in the body. Um, such as when, when you've built up an immunity to something, 
you're talking about you've built up a specific resistance. Um, four characteristics of specific resistance. You've got specificity, systemic action, memory, self or non-self recognition. So uh, it, resistance is to specific things. There's a systemic action that is um, for this specific antigen. You've got, your body has a memory of this. It's, it's been exposed to it before. And it can also pick up on self or non-self. This is something that is not from me. You know, like, like sometimes when it doesn't happen as much now, but used to when you had joint replacements and things, there was a, a lot of times they were rejected. You know, you hear about that when people have um, transplants. You know, you see where people sometimes have trouble with trying to reject it. And what's happening, you're having some of that innate specific resistance is happening like, whoa, this is not of, this is not my liver. This is not my heart and it's trying to reject it and they have ways of fighting that off, but that's kind of where it's picking up on that self or non-self recognition. We have something called antibody mediated immunity that involves our B cells. There's um, two types, plasma B cells, they produce lots of antibodies and then there's memory B cells that remain dormant during an initial encounter, quickly multiply to form plasma B cells in subsequent encounters so this, then that's we're talking about immunity being built up this is interesting especially right now with all the covid in, information out there going on if we can get to where you know they talk about herd immunity and things like that what 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 happens is when you are exposed your initial time you're exposed to something some virus or, or of sort you are your plasma b cells produces a lot of antibodies, they're fighting this stuff off. Um, your memory B cells are just sitting there on your initial reaction. Um, once you get over it, if you are exposed to it again, the memory B cells are what multiply quickly to keep you from having another response to the same thing. That has a lot um, of play in when we get shots and, and our, um, as far as immunity. Vaccinations, that's the word I was looking for. Um, cell mediated immunity, it involves our T cells. There's four different types, cytotoxic, helper T, regulatory T, and memory T. They, and it works much the same. Um, cytotoxic T cells, they recognize cells that are infected. Um, they release perforins and granzymes to kill cells that are not supposed to be there. Your helper T cells, they enhance the immune response by releasing chemicals that activate your cytotoxic T cells and plasma B cells um, have an indirect mode of action. They're just helpers. That's why they're named as having, being indirect. Your regulatory T cells, they moderate the immune response, keep you from, keeps it from going overboard. It turns off the activity of the T cells when it's no longer needed. So that's, that comes back to the body regulating itself to meet that homeostasis. Um, you know, something has to tell the body when to stop fighting, you know, when it's no longer anything to be uh, fought off, then the T cells can be turned off and the regulatory T cells are what, are what do this in cell mediated immunity. <clears throat> Your memory T cells, just like in the previous example, they're inactive during the initial encounter, but they quickly divide to produce additional T cells on subsequent encounters. If you are exposed to something again and you have been vaccinated or you've already had the sick, you've had chicken pox and you're, you know, around someone again, your um, memory T cells are gonna shoot out a bunch of additional T cells because it remembers this, it's pretty, cool that our body can do this actually. Onto the digestive system. The components are your mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, 
small and large intestine, and then there's some accessory organs as well. You've got an alimentary canal versus your accessory organs. Um, the alimentary canal is the long tube through which food components travel. Um, your accessory organs that have to deal with digestion, you've got your salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, pancreas. We know that pancreas has a great deal to do with blood sugar. Um, <clears throat> some functions of the digestive system. You've got ingestion, eating, taking things in, secretion, mixing and propulsion, mechanical and chemical digestion. So you're talking about chewing. That's, an, that's a form of mechanical digestion. Uh, chemical digestion would be, you know, your stomach acid helping to break down foods. Absorption and defecation. Your mouth mechanically digests food by chewing, releasing saliva, water, mucus, something called salivary amylase and salts starts helping the breakdown process. Your pharynx connects your mouth to your esophagus that's where your tonsils are. Your esophagus connects your pharynx to your stomach and propels the food from your pharynx to your stomach. Mucus is released. That helps the food to move along. It also helps to break down. There's no enzymes produced in the esophagus. Your stomach temporarily stores ingested food. Um, there's churning and peristalsis that goes on there. You know, if you hear your stomach uh, making noises when after you eat, um, that's what's going on. You've got churning and peristalsis happening in your stomach. Gastric juice is released. That gastric juice has mucus, hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, intrinsic factor involved. Um, it converts semi-solid bolus, which is what is there after you've chewed it and swallowed it and it got to this point, to a semi-liquid chyme. Your small intestine, intestine, this is where most substances are digested and absorbed that we need. It connects to the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Um, it combines chyme from the stomach with the secretions of the liver and the pancreas. Um, it releases intestinal juice. In the intestinal juice, you've got mucus and enzymes, and it undergoes segmentation and peristalsis. That's the, like a squeezing, which helps the food to keep going through the alimentary canal. So you take it in, you've got to get some out, and that's where peristalsis helps to squeeze to get things down through the tube. Your liver, what does it do? It is a producer of bile, and bile emulsifies fat. Bile breaks down large fat globs into smaller fat globules. Your gallbladder, it stores bile from the liver. It contracts to release bile when fat's present in the small intestine. It doesn't really produce anything. It's just a little sac that is there that holds bile from the liver. Um, luckily, we don't have to have that because I had to have mine taken out. Your pancreas, it releases pancreatic juice into the small intestine. Um, this pancreatic juice is water, bicarbonate, enzymes, and the enzymes are listed here. Pancreatic amylase, pancreatic lipase, proteases, and nucleases. Your large intestine completes the absorption of water and dissolved ions, converts the chyme into feces, and then there's more churning and peristalsis going on in the large intestine. All right, next we'll talk about urinary system. This is a pretty long one, guys, and I, I would like to break it up, but it's easier to just do this all at one big time. You can watch it broken up. Um, Urinary system, the components are the kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, and your urethra. Major function, um, process the blood to form urine. It, basically, you're getting rid of um, items that you don't need. You're excreting 
things from your body that, that you need to get rid of. Your kidneys are the workhorses of the urinary system. They have millions of nephrons. They process and filter your blood. So it goes through a stage of filtration then it reabsor reabsorbs the things that you need, secretes the things that you do not need. It's just the structure of a nephron. We're gonna move along. Um, reproductive systems, we're actually getting pretty close to the end here. And this, these don't really play a lot into what we're gonna cover during this semester. So I'm gonna run through them real quick like. The components of the male reproductive system, we've got testes, epididymis, vas deferens, your prostate gland, seminal vesicles, bulbo urethral glands, and the penis. Um, as far as the female reproductive system, we're talking about ovaries, fallopian tubes, the uterus, vagina, external genitalia. Um, so the male reproductive reproductive systems functions produce sperm, spermatozoa, and delivers spermatozoa to the female reproductive tract. It also produces hormones. Uh, the reproductive reproductive system of the female produce, produces oocytes, it produces hormones, provides a place for embryo and fetal development, and the delivering of babies. And that is the end of the anatomy and physiology chapter. Like I said before, guys, it's um, you will be tested on some of that information, and we'll cover it in some other chapters as well, but it won't be a ton straight from this, but it does set the stage for a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about. So I hope you took the time to go through this, listen and, and catch the points that we're gonna get into further as we go along the semester. So I'm gonna wrap it up for today. Hope you guys are doing well and yell at me if you need anything. Thank you guys.